Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us today on our webinar, the Finance Act 2020 and Nigerian Taxpayers. Uh, sorry that we're a bit late. So we're trying to tidy up a few things. So um, to introduce myself once again, my name is Vivian Chigozemo. I'm a partner and co-founder at BM Professional Solutions. And here to present this um, webinar with me is my partner, Magnus, Magnus Mong. So we do hope that uh, we'll be able to share some insights and we can have a fruitful discussion even as you throw in your own insights, comments and questions. So um, we're going to the Finance Act 2020 is the second Finance Act in a, in a two year period in Nigeria. And it amends about 81 provisions of, of the tax laws. And uh, we're not going to talk about all the 81 provisions because we have just about one hour or uh, just less than two hours to finish the presentation and, and then take questions. So we're not going to talk about the 81 provisions. We're just going to highlight the very important things in each of the tax laws. So um, the tax laws, that, um, okay, before I talk about the tax laws that were amended, we just talk about what the Finance Act 2020 was drafted to do. The Finance Act 2020 was drafted to support Nigeria, the realization of Nigeria's 2021 revenue projections in our budget. And then to also adopt measures that would balance you know, the economy, especially uh, now that the pandemic is ravaging everything. And then to also enhance the efficiency of fiscal incentives. So uh, these are the three key things, uh, according to President Buhari, when he was doing his budget presentation speech, that the Finance Act is meant to is meant to achieve. So like I said earlier, 14 tax and related laws were amended and the, um, several of them are the normal tax laws that impact businesses and individuals on a daily basis, while the other ones are just the very specialized laws, like when you talk about the Fiscal Responsibility Act, Public Procurement Act, those are specialized laws, the CAMA, that um, you know, it doesn't impact uh, people, businesses and taxpayers every day. So the changes there, we're just going to talk about them on a high level and then, uh, and then um, but we'll concentrate more on what impacts everyday taxpayer in Nigeria. Okay, so um, coming to the CETA, I'll start from the Companies Income Tax Act. So what are the things, what are the important things we should note about the CETA in the Finance Act 2020? What are the changes that have happened? Where were we, where are we coming from and what are these changes? So um, now I'll, I'll have to talk about this one. Last year in the Finance Act 2019, there was this um, provision that was included or that was introduced provision Okay, sorry, please, if you have, as, as I am presenting, if you have questions, please put them on the chat box or put them on the Q&A. You can also introduce yourself on the chat box so you can network, we can all network with each other. So we're going to take all the questions and discussions after I and Magnus must have presented what we have to present. Then we'll take the discussions and all the questions. So, okay, back to what I was saying. Last year for agricultural production business or companies under the Companies Income Tax Act, there was something that the Finance Act 2019 introduced. It introduced like an automatic tax waiver, income tax waiver for businesses generally in agricultural production for up to eight years, first five years, and then subject to um, satisfactory performance you get another three years, that's eight years. So this year, that provision of the law has been deleted. So meaning that it's no longer automatic exemption. And that last year, people were like, what is agricultural production? What's the definition? And people tried to borrow the definition from, from the section in, in CITA that defines agricultural business. So 
right now the that provision of the law something similar let's say has been included in the income tax industrial um relief in, uh, in industrial development income tax relief act that's the DITRA. something like that has been included there which we're going to talk about later so what's uh, what the highlight is is for smes there will be tax relief for smes defined in line with the definition in CETA that's for small companies, those earning 25 million in annual gross turnover or less, and for medium companies, those earning between 25 and 100 million. So you're entitled to pioneer tax relief if you apply for it. It's not automatic. At with you apply for it at NIPC, Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, at Abuja, and you have you can have tax relief for up to uh, six years first four years and another two years. So, but from what we know about applying for Pioneer, it's not an easy task and we don't see any SME being able, you know, to, to apply for or being able to afford application for Pioneer. First of all, you have to go to Abuja to submit. And um, there are other provisions in the law which we don't even know whether they will waive it for SMEs. Like if you want to, the, the, the Pioneer tax relief laws says the guideline says that for you to apply you have to have non-tangible assets not non-tangible um tangible fixed assets tangible fixed assets of up to 100 million naira in value so how many smes have that kind of you know uh, fixed assets of up to 100 million naira and then you have to apply for it in your first year you have to apply for pioneer within your first 12 months in operation. So those are the you know, provisions that might even mitigate against any SME applying for Pioneer. And we don't know if there will be a special waiver because of the, um, the, the new provisions of the Finance Act 2020. So then another one under the CIT is that uh, loans granted by banks to uh, agricultural trade or businesses before now it has now been restricted to primary agricultural production. And the Finance Act 2020 defines primary agricultural production as production, primary crop production, primary livestock production, primary forestry production, and primary fishing production. So essentially there's, um, process, there's no processing or, or manufacturing, whether intermediate or advanced, that will be allowed. So it's just raw food stuff. Then um, you now have a non-Nigerian companies, another change that happened, non-Nigerian companies taxable in Nigeria, uh, other than where withholding tax is final tax, I refer to, okay, let me just um, so, uh, explain it so that I don't breathe out. So now Nigerian companies that are supposed to you know, that are taxable in Nigeria. They are now required, they are, there's more elaborate pro provisions as to how they comply to companies' income tax. So before now, there were issues about deemed income, permanent establishment, you know, them having to, there was this publication sometime in, um, I can't remember the year, or some years back, this FRS uh, public notice in the newspaper that talked about that permanent establishment are meant to submit their, uh, audited account, do their tax competitions, audited accounts of their results from the Nigerian operations, do their tax competitions based on that, fuel self-assessment forms, just like other companies, other Nigerian companies. So it was like trying to elaborate on you guys must do this thing just like a Nigerian company, even though you're a permanent establishment. So um, now it has come to be included in the law. That, so specifically written that you have to include your audited account, full audited account, that's the, your full company audited account, whether it's from Nigeria, whether the results are from Nigeria or from somewhere else, your full account, to be attested by an independent or qualified accountant, independent qualified or, or certified accountant in Nigeria. So this is your audited account for your entire company. It's supposed to be attested by a qualified accountant independent of your company here in Nigeria. You're also meant to submit your financial statements of your Nigerian operations 
and then tax, normal tax computation, company income tax computation, self-assessment forms, and then you file your returns. So that means um, that's an additional compliance burden for non-resident companies that are taxable in Nigeria. That is where withholding tax is not the final tax. Then for this one is uh, for, uh, impacting more small and medium companies or micro small and medium companies who do not usually keep proper records of accounts, you know, proper books of accounts. So this one is saying that every company, every company in Nigeria is required to maintain adequate books or records of accounts containing sufficient information or data of all transactions that it has to be in English language. If it's not in English language, you will be required to convert it to English language translate at your own cost uh, when the revenue requires you to do that. And whenever the revenue asks you for or your books of accounts and you're not able to provide it, you will be liable to penalty of 100,000 Naira in the first month of default and subsequent month 50,000. That's a whole lot of money. So uh, companies should be able to keep adequate books of accounts, even for your own, your, your own company's good. You have to keep records so you can make decisions based on credible numbers. If you cannot keep records, you can always subscribe to any small accounting software that will help you to keep the records as if you are a professional accountant. So then um, we now have um, companies that, you know, that usually understate their profits. A lot of companies in Nigeria have like two or three types of audited accounts or two or three versions. So one version is showing a loss, the other version is showing a uh, profit for shareholders, the other version is showing maybe small profit, you know, or, or, or the, a net asset that is good for bankers. So different sets of audited accounts, but the one that goes to tax authorities usually in a loss position or maybe has little profit. So the Finance Act is now including a provision that says that if it is found that you falsified your accounts, or profit so that your tax payable will be small, that an additional income tax assessment, assessment and penalty and interest will be levied on you, and it will start from the date that you filed your incorrect tax return. So um, it's a very scary thing because if this is found out in like two or three years after you file that wrong uh, audited account or wrong statement of account, you will be levied penalty and interest, an additional income tax assessment for, for that period. Then another thing to note is um, small and medium companies as defined under the CETA, I've defined it earlier in this session. They will now, they may not, the, the Finance Act um, 2020 is not, Assertive is not saying that they will be exempted from submitting audited accounts. We all know that the CAMA was amended last year. The Companies and, uh, and Allied Matters Act was amended last year. And small companies were exempted from preparing and filing audited accounts, from preparing audited accounts. So people were now asking if the CAMA is exempting small businesses, small companies from preparing audited accounts, what about the the CETA, which still requires you to prepare audited account and file. So this is uh, kind of good news, but to be taken with mixed feelings because you don't know. The law is not exempting you. It's just saying that FRS may decide not to collect audited accounts from you, but they will tell you in what form your account should be if it is not audited account. So maybe the best thing to do is for small and medium companies to have, you know, um, like I said before, an accounting system that you can put in place that you can use to generate credible reports or credible set of accounts because so many people they are not accountants so many people they don't have financial training so they don't they don't even know what the standards accounting standards require you to do even people cannot do bookkeeping for their business so they just keep simple records on excel or notebook so but if you have an accounting software it already has features, it's like a template to give you, okay, just raise your invoice here, 
don't worry about the other things. Just identify your expense and uh, cash um, dealings and all that. And the system will now do it for you in a way that it should be done. So that's the best advice or recommendation I would give. Then um, to also help or to, to serve as a palliative to people who have, or organizations who have made donations in cash or kind to government funds for pandemic or natural disaster or other exigencies. Because there will be you, your donations made in cash or kind, which is verified, will now be tax deductible under the CETA, but limited to 10%, limited to 10% of your company's accessible profits after deducting all other allowable donations in that year. So the initial version of the finance bill, the, the first draft of the finance bill allowed you to carry forward if you could not um, exhaust this, this um, it had, the provision there was, was restricted to 25%. And if you couldn't use it up in that first year, you could carry it forward to subsequent years. But here now, no such um, provision is included in the Gazette copy. The Gazette copy of the Finance Act came out, actually uh, came out, yes, was released yesterday. We got uh, our own copy yesterday. So the Gazette copy is not saying anything about carrying forward if you do not utilize it in the first year. And it's limited to 10% of the company's accessible profit after deducting all other liable donations in that year. Then you have this other palliative on minimum tax. Minimum tax, many people, especially companies in the oil and gas, in the manufacturing, they've complained about the minimum tax, about the in, in, increase in effective tax rate of minimum tax to 0.5% of gross turnover. So it's, it's, it has been an issue. So now the Finance Act is seeking to like ameliorate this issue, at least within the years that the pandemic is ravaging the economy. Beginning, so if you're going to file your tax returns and your tax filing period falls in any date between or from 1st January 2020 to 31st December 2021. And then your minimum tax, if you're going to pay minimum tax, then it, it will no longer be 0.5%, it will now be 0.25. That's like 50% waiver for, for everyone, every company that is liable to pay minimum tax. It's not every company that is liable to pay um, minimum tax. So companies that are into, in agric into agricultural production are not going to pay minimum tax. Companies that are small companies that are um, earning 25 million in annual turnover or less, they are not going to pay minimum tax. And companies that are in their first four years of operation, they are not going to pay. So every other company will pay minimum tax. Then um, companies can now claim capital allowance on their software development or acquisition expenditure. Now that we're, we're all going digital, the economies are going digital, businesses are going and uh, digital, implementing tech, tech here, everywhere you go is tech, tech. Um, I think the Finance Act is trying to also keep, um, keep up to the current reality that businesses are now using uh, digital platforms to conduct their operations. So there will be huge expenditure in software either in development or in acquisition. So it's now allowing it as, a, as, a, as an expenditure, qualifying capital expenditure for claim of capital allowance. So the, the irony is that before now, software expenditure had either been amortized or people would add it to the hardware and also claim investment allowance and also capital allowance. So, but, that was what was done, even though it wasn't specifically stated in the law, but now it's now stated in the law that you can claim capital allowance on software development or acquisition expenditure, but the law did not actually give the rates. There's no rates of capital allowance. The second schedule has been amended, but there was no rate given either for initial or annual allowance. So um, maybe that will be corrected later or probably will continue doing it the way we've been doing it, claiming it, you know, just like other plant machinery and fixtures. 
initial allowance 50% and then annual allowance 25%. Then uh, the law, the Finance Act 2020 defines public character, public character in respect to um, organization or institution. And it says it's an organization or institution that is registered in accordance with the relevant law in Nigeria and does not distribute or share its profits in any manner to members or promoters. So if you check all the tax laws, you'll find out that where public character is mentioned is is in this Companies Income Tax Act under exempt income, exempt profits, and also in the Capital Gains Tax Act. And it all points to um, ecclesiastical, charitable, and educational organizations that render, you know, like it says education, like in CETA it says educational um, uh, services of, of a of a public character, something in that light. So there's there's this confusion as to the public character because when you check, what is is there anything like public character in the tax laws? These are the two things that pop up under the CETA, under profit exempt, and under the capital gains tax act. So you begin to ask yourself, is it in relation to what the services, or is it in relation to the profit that they generate? That is these three types of organizations which public character has been used to define? Is it in relation to the services or what they do to the activities or is it in relation to the um, profit or is it in relation to the institution that they are made tax exempt? So, but there has been this ongoing controversy for some years now. I remember when we were also writing um, tax discourse publications for the FRS, uh, the, some of the top directors were discussing it this um, whether educational institutions would be allowed, you know, not to be paying tax because you have so many schools and their proprietors is like a business. They do it as a business. So one will wonder why they are not paying company income tax. So this definition here now, you know, has the capacity of overturning that tax exemption to say, hey, if, you're, if you do distribute or share your profit, in any manner to your members or promoters, that means you're not qualified to, to have that tax exemption. But further, I'm sure further communications will come up and further explanations will come up to clarify what this definition of public character actually is, is referring to. So, uh, but for, for now, that is our own interpretation. So going into, quickly going into the Value Added Tax Act and the important changes, uh, you know, the very important ones, because we're working on a high level here. We can't talk about every single thing and we can't give detailed advisory. You know, you can't, nobody can actually finish it in a webinar. That's what, you know, tax practice is meant to do. People have tax practice to talk about tax, give tax advisory as a means of livelihood. So there's no way we can talk about it in one, in one webinar. So the, um, for the changes in VAT, um, it affects non-residents, non-resident persons that supply. There's a whole section that was actually deleted and it's replaced with this definition of what non-residents should be doing with regards to VAT. Before now, there were several things included in that section, including the fact that oil and gas companies will be withholding, uh, will be reverse withholding VAT is in one of the subsections of that section. So right now, that whole section has been deleted and replaced with what non-residents alone should be doing. Non-resident persons that supply goods or services, that supply, they say, uh, that, do, that do, do taxable supplies to Nigeria. And when you, when you read the definition of taxable supplies from the Finance Act 2019, all that interpretation tells you like, any good or service that is supplied, you know, so if, including the exempt ones, they are all defined as taxable supplies. This year in the Finance Act 2020, under the new definitions, um, um, it's saying that taxable supplies in relation to goods, in relation to services, in relation to incorporeal. So it's now defining taxable supplies in relation to goods, services, and incorporeal. 
um, it has so many provisions, but the important thing is it's, it's defined in, in relation to the principle of um, uh, destination that where is the service, where is the service to be consumed or where is the service to be supplied? So it's if the, if the goods and services are produced, supplied, consumed in Nigeria, and then incorporeal, if the rights to retire in Nigeria or owned in Nigeria, you know, then those are the definitions in relation to what taxable supply is. And so you could now apply it to any non-resident that makes taxable supply, that makes, makes. One would also argue, is it just once or makes? Is it like present continuous taxable supplies to uh, Nigeria? Should register for TIN. So it's, a, it's an expanded scope. That means every non-resident company that does business and or actually supplies things to Nigeria, good services, intangibles, you know, should or is expected by law to register in Nigeria and get a tax identification number. You remember last year, Finance Act 2019, tax identification number became a way of identifying the company or a company for company income tax purpose instead of um, the RC number that was there before. It's now tax identification. So the non-resident making tax that makes taxable supply to Nigeria is meant to register and get a TIN. Then you're meant to charge VAT on your invoices for taxable goods. Please note that there's a, dif there's a difference in definition of taxable goods and services and taxable supplies. Taxable supplies is almost like everything, you know, whether it's exempt or not. Once it's a supply, then according to the definition of the VAT Act, then taxable goods and services are those goods and services that are not listed in the first schedule to the VAT Act. That's the definition. So please note the, the differences. Then they, it's now saying that when a non-resident makes this taxable supply and then you put VAT on invoice on those goods and services that are taxable, the Nigerian recipient of the goods or services is meant to withhold the tax and then pay over to the FRS with the TIN number of the non-resident company, of course. So uh, he's also saying that FRS can also appoint, you know, any other person to be the one that will withhold that VAT that they charge and then pay to remit it to the FRS. Then, um, because that whole um, section, like I said before, has been deleted. The section, subsection two or so, I, I can't remember immediately of that section was talking about oil and gas companies withholding, reverse withholding the VAT at source and then remitting to FRS. It has also been deleted. So if you check the CETA now, there's no other provision that requires oil and gas companies, you know, to specifically withhold VAT at source and remit to the FRS. So it then leads it to the interpretation that it's no longer a requirement by law. So unless some other clarification comes up from the FRS, this is the position that we are going to take. So um, when I say we, I mean our firm, BM Professional Solutions. So another good thing is building. You know, last, um, last year it was land, the land, the land had been excluded from the scope of um, the definition of goods or services. So that means it's no longer, like anything that had to do with land will no longer come on that path, so there won't be any path. So people were like, buildings are not separate from land. You cannot remove a building from the land. Both of them go together. So if you say land, it's land and everything on top of it. So it had been a, a subject of controversy throughout last year. So, but good news is this year, the Finance Act 2020 has also removed building and as part of land from the scope of goods or services for VAT purposes. So anything that has to do with building land, either sale or lease can now be interpreted to mean that there's no VAT. It's not a good or service, so you cannot charge VAT. So, but the VAT Act is also specific about services rendered 
in connection to immovable, existing immovable property. So like agency service, like uh, engineering services, um, other services or, or valuation services, services that are in, uh, rendered in connection to existing immovable properties, they are also vertible. So like I shared in one of the platforms I belong to, the Realtors platform, this is a good news for Realtors because they won't be bothered again about VAT and they can sell easily. And the people that are into real estate can also, you know, not bother about VAT. But what I did share then is some people actually sell a uh, property that is not existing. I, I don't know, um, someone else might have a different view, but where you're selling water, some people sell water that is not even sand filled, a, a mass of water and it's sold. So that one shouldn't even qualify as existing immovable property. So if you're an agent and you're selling that kind of, you know, mass of water, maybe you shouldn't even um, be concerned about that on it because it's, it's not existing yet. It's not an immovable property that is existing. Well, someone might argue that the mass of water is, is existing, but is it immovable? So let's, let's even not go into that. So the main point here is that land and building are no longer you know, subject, subject to VAT in Nigeria, or they are no longer in, um, included in either goods or service for, for VAT purposes. So when you're leasing or buying, don't bother about VAT. Then another thing that has happened, commercial aircraft, their engines and spare parts are now classified as exempt goods. A lot of other changes happen with um, this commercial uh, aircraft. Even the sale of tickets has also been exempted. Sale of uh, airline tickets. You will also find it in the customs exemption, exemption from custom duties, um, spare parts and tools used by commercial uh, aircraft. So a lot of uh, tax incentive incentives have been given to people who who run or own aircraft in Nigeria right now. So this is one of them. Commercial aircraft, their engines, spare parts that are supplied, they are now classified as exempt goods. So there's no VAT on them. Then airline transportation tickets issued by issued and sold by commercial airlines registered in Nigeria. So tickets, airline transportation tickets issued and sold by commercial airlines registered in Nigeria are now also VAT exempt. So someone was asking me, was it the day before yesterday when I was on radio talking about tax that he runs an um, agency for, for travel agency that he sells tickets. So my response that whether his services are VAT, VAT exempt. So what his services surely would not be VAT exempt, but the tickets that he's selling, my response to him was um, that this, this, are, this is the exact thing that the law is saying. Tickets sold by commercial airlines registered in Nigeria. So no one will need to review your own business structure or your own um, company structure to find out whether you, you or what you're selling are exempt or can be included on that on that is definition. Then um, talk about hire or rental of and, and lease of tractors, plows, and other agricultural, of agricultural equipment for agricultural purposes. So please let's, let's just note these definitions because definitions are what um, they play a big part or they even play, play the most part in determining whether tax is applicable or not. So once you get the definition wrong, you begin to make mistakes. So hire or rental or lease of tractors and other agricultural equipment for agricultural purposes. So if it's not for agricultural purpose, it's not that exempt. So if it's for agricultural purpose, then it is exempt service. So there's no VAT on it when you hire or lease a, a tractors and equipment. So um, the VAT also made the, the Finance Act 2020 under the VAT Act also made elaborate definitions of time of supply. That when would this thing be deemed as 
haven't been supplied. So, uh, but the summary is that the summary of what all those provisions is that time of supply will normally be deemed that as the time that the invoice, the tax invoice was issued. So if, if the supply is between related parties and no invoice is issued, or if the supply happens over a long period of time, like two years, or if it is a, a, a contract of construction, construction, the good, or, the good is being constructed, then it will now be the time of supply. The time of supply will follow the, the phases of delivery of the goods or service. Once the goods or service, once the goods are delivered or in tranches, each tranche is the time of supply for that tranche. And when no invoice is issued, it is the time of supply of the good or service. For service is, is the time that the service is rendered or in the phases, each of the phase of the service will be the time of supply for, for that purposes. So if it's digital copy, it's the time it's made available to the person that, it, that is going to pay for it. Then um, I'm almost rounding up my own presentation. So the changes made to the federal FRS EA Act, the Federal Inland Revenue um, Food Service um, Empower, um, Empowerment Act, I, I think so. F FRS EA, please, pardon me. So many things to cram. <laughs> okay, so changes made. Uh, a major one is that FRS can now deploy um, digital solutions and third-party payment processors for tax purposes. So, if you if you if you are following the trend, there has been this VAT track <clears throat> that FRS has been plugging right into the revenue source or channel of many organizations and they are going like in industry, industry by industry. They've done it for telecoms they, they, or they've negotiated for telecoms. I think it's been deployed. They've done it for large retail chains. Like if you go to ShopRite to buy something and they issue you receipt, you're going to see FRS logo there. That, that, that shows they've been implemented backtrack for ShopRite right from their head office. So they've been doing it actively. A lot of digital solutions are being used. In fact, digital is the way to go because you can't do anything manually. And the company you're going to, or the, the firm organization you're going to do um, administer tax to, they are using uh, complex digital solutions. So you cannot but you know, match it. So the Finance Act is now specifically saying that FRS is empowered to deploy digital solutions. As, um, as a means of tax administration or collection or third party payment processes for collecting tax. So if this digital solution is to be deployed to your own company or business or firm, then you, you as a taxpayer, you should be given 30 days notice um, by the FRS. That's what the act is saying. Then the FRS has the power to call for books, returns, documents, or physical interview with any individual, it's now saying individual, individual company, normally individuals are accessible to the state where they reside. But now the Finance Act is now adding it to, the, to this uh, FRSDA Act that FRS can call any individual or company or any person. That means any um, or, uh, entity. Entities are persons, legal persons. So for, for the purpose of doing its work, it can call you to interview you or, or, tell, or ask you to provide more documents anytime. And uh, there are penalties for failure to, to comply with such notices. It's going to do so by, by way of notice, notify you that we need you to do this and that, or by circulars. So failure to comply would attract penalties. Then um, also banks and other financial institutions, they are, they are now meant to submit. FRS can ask on demand, they will submit information about their customers, you know, and um, their penalties for failure to, to comply with this. Information about their customers, whether they are resident in Nigeria or not. And then FRS is also given the power to honor international agreements, do what it can 
to honor to deliver information to honor international you know agreements <clears throat> on tax then um, tax assessments or objections they can now be made via electronic means so the tax can be assessed you can do your objection through emails or other electronic means so it doesn't have to be like a letter that you take to somewhere to abuja or to tax office you can just do it by by email then the tax appeal tribunal can also now conduct its hearing remotely via virtual meetings or using technology as may be necessary to ensure fair hearing so i'm sure this is in line with the new normal that you know you don't have to tra travel or be physically present you can actually do your hearings through um, digital conferencing or other other kinds of platforms so um there's also the before we go into a tertiary education uh, trust fund there's also this um, provision for confidentiality so um those handling tax information should hold it um uh, confidential it shouldn't be abused or or uh, exposed to someone else that is not supposed to hear or see it it shouldn't be used for other purposes that that uh, signal abuse and so if you're if you're a former member of the board or former member of frs or a current member or you're an agent of the frs or any other person that is empowered to collect tax information should uh, hold um, hold it confidentially you're not supposed to expose it and failure to do so if you if you are found guilty of exposing uh, or leaking confidential information or abusing it then you're you're going to on um, prosecution you're going to pay one million naira fine or three years imprisonment mm -hmm. so now to the tertiary education trust one is easy um Last year, the small businesses were exempt from paying company income tax, and people were like, oh, so what's going to happen to tertiary education tax? Small companies, alone, not small businesses. Small biz um, if you're not a company, you're not going to pay ed um, education tax at all, tertiary education tax. So it's just for companies. So small companies have now been exempted specifically from paying from paying tertiary education tax. So what you have noticed, you know, this uh, exemption of small companies from paying tax, company income tax, is like, um, I don't even know the percentage, it's less than 1% of small businesses in Nigeria, because up to 97% of, according to the Smidan report, and um, in conjunction with the National Bureau of Statistics, that was in 20, 17 that was released in 2017 or so then you have about 41.5 million small uh, and medium businesses in nigeria micro small and medium businesses in nigeria i'm not sure whether they're out to 41.5 million right now considering that many small businesses closed up last year so going by that report and the statistics they said that registered businesses that is businesses that are at all registered, whether it's company or business name, they are less than 3% or 97% of SME, MSMEs are not registered at all. And then the ones that are companies are just about 71,000. So out of 41.5 million MSMEs, it's just uh, 71,000 that this exemption from company income tax and tertiary education tax applies to other businesses that are sole proprietors, business names, they're not exempt from income tax. So if you want to enjoy that exemption, you just have to incorporate your small business. Another thing to note is that under the tertiary education tax, the provisions as to offenses have been moved, have been deleted. So that, that means there's no more offense if you don't file. So whatever that means, our own interpretation, there is no more offense. So, but of course, we know there are offenses and penalties for not filing company income tax and 
the share education tax usually goes hand in hand with com income tax. So maybe they are telling us to don't don't bother about this one. Just bother about filing your company income tax or need that returns. So and this is where I stop and hand over to Magnus to to continue and take us through to the end. So thank you once again for listening to me. I hope I did make some sense. And uh, if you have questions about the things I've talked about or the things I've explained, or if you have comments or different views from, from my own views, please put it on the chat box, box or put it in the Q&A um, of, of our webinar. Thank you so much for listening. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Magnus Mong. I'm also a partner with VM Professional Solutions. VM is a professional services firm that handles tax audit advisory for individuals, governments, and various organizations using digital technology. So one of the digital tools that um, we also have that support businesses is if you look at the Finance Act now, there are a couple of several changes that have crystallized. So we want to encourage all our attendees to go to either the Android store or the iOS store and look for our tax law app. We will play the video at the end of this presentation. With the tax law app, you're able to get um, on the go from your phone and the comfort of your phone. You can view um, the relevant tax law and hopefully before the end of next month with the updated changes of the Finance Act 2020. Today, I'll be taking you through um, the remaining uh, notable changes in the Finance Act. The first one I'll be talking about is the Capital um, Gains Act. Vivian, will you, be, will you be flipping the chat for me since you're presenting? All right, thanks. So like we all know, um, the Capital Gains Act is typically, um, the filing requirement is typically done alongside when you file your company income tax um, assessment. Now with the changes in Finance Act, um, there are now new filing deadlines, especially when it comes to disposal of assets. What this means is that for any disposal of assets that was done between the 1st of January and the 29th of June, you have a filing requirement, um, self-assessment filing requirement by the 30th of June. And if that disposal occurs between the 1st of July and 30th of December, the filing requirement will be done by 31st of December. So it's important to take note of these two dates. What it then means is regardless of when the disposal is done, the self-assessment filing for capital gains tax has to be done in that same year. So there are two filing deadlines to note as introduced by the Finance Act. Next slide, William. Or would you rather I share my screen? Would you rather I share my screen? I, if you choose to, but I can flip it for you. All right, thanks. Okay, keep, uh, keep changing it for me. So the next notable change by the um, Capital Gains Tax Act is the whole issue about whether compensation for loss of office is taxable or if it's taxable to a certain um, um, amount. So the introduction with the Finance Act now is that for any compensation for loss of office that is above 10 million naira, capital gains tax at 10% would apply. What it then means is for any compensation of, for loss of office that is between one naira and 10 million, there will be no tax at all. It's important to note that the person who is making the payment for that capital gains has the responsibility to render the returns and make the payment to the relevant tax authorities. And the tax filing or the time of such payment is in line with the PYE regulations. What it then means is if you make a payment of, if you make a payment of um, capital gains tax this month, and there is a capital that is above 10 million, and there is a tax due, that tax needs to be rendered to the relevant state tax authority on or before the tenth working day of the following month. So that's the key notable change um, from the um, capital gains tax act. Compensation for loss of office subject to a maximum of 10% is now liable to um, CGT. Under the Personal Income Tax Act, there are a couple of changes. The Personal Income Tax Act has now been redefined in the sense that the definition for gross income has now been straight to include only incomes that are taxable 
tool in the hands of the employee. What does this mean? For all employees, sole proprietors, and business people, taxable under the Personal Income Tax Act, we will now be enjoying lower personal relief or consolidated relief because the definition for what constitutes your gross income, which your personal relief is a factor of, has now been reduced. So we flex only incomes that are taxable. All non-taxable incomes that either though were brought in as way of payment or part of your gross income has now been ex excluded in the definition of um, um, you know, gross income for purpose of calculating consolidated relief and capital gains tax. Annual life insurance premium paid to individuals for themselves and their spouse will now be allowed, is now an allowable um, tax deduction under personal income tax. So this is a tax savings. So either do um, spouses are not included, so you can take up insurance premium for yourself and your spouse. So insurance premium for yourself and your spouse that was paid for last year will be used in this year as um, a, a deductible allowance for, for the purpose of calculating your personal income tax act. So um, all employees need to take note and notify their HR representative or their payroll officers of any changes along these lines. So tax rules for new commencement date. So there's been a bit of ambiguity in terms of the commencement rule for businesses that are liable to personal income tax, especially sole traders. So right now, the, the, the Finance Act 2020 has sort of reduced or relaxed that ambiguity or eliminated that ambiguity in the sense that it is now clear that for businesses commencing business, the first year of business is the date of starting business to the next to the um, financial year end. So that's the first year of business. The second year of business will now be the first working day after the last financial year to the next financial year and so on and so forth. So that ambiguity is businesses prior to this period you can pay tax you can pay double tax double taxation on two on one particular um, period whereas right now it is no longer in existence next slide please. so salaries of workers any equivalent of national minimum wage or less are now exempt from PY tax so this has been brought in by Finance Act, and the concern here was that either to this period, where we do have national youth coppers working for our organizations, people who earn stipends and people who earn, you know, wages and stuff, were prior to this period liable to Personal Income Tax Act. What this then means is that with the introduction of the na national minimum wage, be it um, contract worker, be it somebody who is on permanent employment, as long as that person's um, earning is just in the bracket of the minimum wage, PAY tax will not apply. So this provision is clear that if you have a youth copper who is earning just about the minimum wage, there will be no need to include PAY tax. So it's more about the quantum of the amount rather than the individual or the status of the individual in question. Furthermore, the profit from a trade or business that comprises the provision of technical management consultancy or professional services by individuals, executors, or trustees, or persons for persons who do business outside of Nigeria with people who are in Nigeria, who now can now be determined to constitute significant presence. So the Minister of Finance will be required sometime in future or over the next couple of weeks or months to be able to bring out the clarification of what determines significant economic presence for people who are outside of the country but habitually. Um, carry on some kind of business along this lines. People involved in technical uh, management, consultancy service, or professional services, um, you know, in Nigeria, but do not have um, a physical presence in Nigeria. So we'll be, we'll be on the lookout to see what the implication will be um, when we get the clarification for the Minister of Finance, what significant um, economic presence in Nigeria would entail. It is important to note that there is a similar provision of this in the, in the Company Income Tax Act. So I think with the introduction of the Finance Act, they've now brought a similar provision for um, sole traders and people who are outside of Nigeria who have actually um, carry on trade or, or have taxable presence as it were. So salaries of workers, we've talked about this um, in the past. So move on to the next slide. Minimum wage is no longer, it's no longer liable to pay white tax. We 
you've talked, you're going back, you need to go forward. So we now talk about customs and excise duties. There has been notable changes in the Customs and Excise Duties Act. So duties involved for, for people involved in importing tractors, motor vehicles, transportation of goods and passengers need to be aware of the new dutiable rates and sort of help to enforce. One thing we see happen in Nigeria is that we make laws, implementations are rather slow, but we need to be aware of this so that um, when we do get the opportunity of getting involved in this, we can begin um, to challenge them. One of the important things you need to be aware of is the rates. So one thing to note is that for, for tractors, vehicles, that duties on tractors have been reduced from 35% to 5%. Then duties for motor vehicles for the transportation of more than 10 persons have also been reduced from 35 um, to 10%. Then levies on motor vehicles for transportation of persons, i.e. cars, has also been reduced from 30% to 5%. Wide duties for motor vehicles for the transportation of goods and, and services has been reduced from 35 um, to 10%. It is important we are aware of this HR new, new rate so that when we do get a situation where we need to pay our um, duties, we can either challenge or ask for clarifications why the rates are not looking at what um, it is. So chances are that um, we'll begin to see a lot more influx of imported vehicles. There'll be challenges for the likes of Innocent who produce vehicles locally. Um, because with these rates, you see that due to transportation vehicles, vehicles for moving passengers and what have you, have now have um, relaxed duty rates. So I'm not sure how um, local content or people involved locally um, will be supported. So telecommunication services um, organization needs to be mindful that going forward, um, you know, um, exchange duty will now be liable. Um, as prescribed by, by the president. So there's no exact rates that we've seen, but um, we expect further communications from the, from the president in terms of telecommunication services. So for those involved in airline industries, this is good news. I think it's with regards to some of the challenges that people have faced with the recent lockdown and global um, logistics disruption and travel disruptions across the world. For those involved in airline organizations, especially those that are registered in Nigeria, if you do import your aircraft um, or spare parts or any component of any of your, of your aircraft, as long as you're registered in Nigeria and providing commercial tra air transportation services, you are now exempted from further um, um, duty charges on all those parts and the entire aircraft. Historically, it used to be on only the aircraft, but right now, it's been expanded to include engines, spare parts, and other components of the aircraft. So this is a welcome development for those who are involved in the airline services. Um, if you look at what is happening in, 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 in the global space for, for, for air travel. So we move to Stamp Duties Act. It's important to note that as at 30th of last year, 30th of July last year, um, there was an inter interministerial committee that was set up by the president and the, in conjunction with the FIRS. And this committee was charged with the responsibility to audit and recover five year stamp duty charges from relevant government agencies, ministries, departments, and agencies. Members of these committees include uh, members from the Central Bank, the Federal Ministry of Justice, the FIRS, and, the, and as well as um, the Federal Ministry of Budget and National Planning. This committee is saddled with the responsibility to um, execute and collect stamp duty for over five years. We are aware that this committee has rolled out its operations at the beginning of, September, beginning of December by identifying various organizations that are going around in all the financial services sectors of the, of, of the nooks and cranny of the Federation and the ministries, departments, and agencies. Their mandate is straight and simple, to audit organizations that have been earmarked between the 15th of January 2016 and the 30th of June 2022, to recover to audit and recover stamp duties. So, what does this mean for organizations? We begin to see a lot more traction, a lot more audits happening all over the entire country. I'm sure that if you're, if any of our attendees who are members of the financial services sector, 
they probably would have seen some some of those um, notifications going around requesting for commencement meeting and stamp duty and um, kickoff exercises. Next slide, please. So what are the changes introduced um, by the Finance Act? There's been some ambiguity with regards to, oh, it is 50 naira for this amount, 50 naira for that amount. So what Finance Act has now done now is that it has now extracted and created a new section, section 89A, and it clearly states that there will be a 50 naira stamp duty on all bank transfer deposits. Um, and this has now been replaced and known to be called electronic money transfer levy. And this will be only applicable to transfers and deposits that are 10,000 naira and above. And irrespective of your account type, be it savings, whatever, as long as there's an inflow or um, into your account, into any of those accounts, this electronic transfer levy will apply. This money is quite huge. If you look at the volume of transactions that happen daily, so we need to be, we need to watch this space and then begin to identify how to mitigate or see how to um, have some tax planning advantages around them. Next slide. So I, I, as we all know, sometime last year when the Finance Act was amended or introduced in, in the last Finance Act change, there were a lot of back and forth and quarrel between the chairman of the FIRS and the chairman of the Nigerian Postal Services as regards to who has responsibility for administering the adhesive stamp. It is also important to know that as of July last year, the FIRS launched its own adhesive stamp. But with the introduction of the Finance Act 2020, it brought to rest who has responsibility for designing, administering, and providing adhesive stamp for the purpose of stamp duty. And that responsibility rests on the shoulder of the Nigerian Postal Services. They have the responsibility for um, designing and making available stamp duty adhesive stamps that will be used for the purpose of um, this um, act. So um, NEPSA and OGEPSA, that's the Nigerian Export Processing Zone Act and Oil and Gas Exporting Zone Act. The changes or introductions that were made by the Finance Act to these two legislations are similar in the sense that um, both acts relate to organizations and people who live and work in designated free trade zones and areas that we, we term as non-custom areas, even though they are physically present in Nigeria, but they have their own um, sort of different legislation. What the Finance Act has done is to try to say, next slide, we have, is try to say that for the purpose of companies who operate in the um, free trade zone act, such companies need to ensure that they comply with certain provisions of the Capital Income Tax Act by ensuring that they file their returns. They may be exempted from paying of tax, but they need to ensure that the returns is filed in line with the provisions of the Capital um, um, Company Income Tax Act. And please note that if you fail to um, file this return as it's, as, as it's required, you may, you may lose that exemption of not paying your tax. So care has to be taken for organizations, especially those in the oil and gas business that have um, you know, operations in the oil and gas free trade zone area to monitor these changes and ensure that they can put things in place to meet the statutory filing requirement of writing their tax returns um, to the FIRS as at when due. And I think for, for all intent and purpose, most of the free trade zones that we have in the country have designated desks. Um, for FIRS officers and other associated um, revenue. So filing of such returns should continue to remain um, easy for those guys who operate in those locations. Um, the Industrial Development Training for, um, Relief Act also brought in some changes. Next slide. And these changes include around the fact that income tax holiday will now be granted to small and medium companies engaged in primary agriculture. If you remember, and when Vivian presented, she did highlight um, the interpretation and some of the advantages of um, those involved in primary agriculture. So the tax holiday that has now been set is, is now um, six years of when they apply. So small, those, those small and medium companies need to ensure that they go to apply to take advantage of this. I think what the government is trying to do here is to provide a lot more relief for organizations that operate um, in the agriculture, agricultural area to ensure that they are able to uh, mitigate the hardship that was brought about by, by the pandemic for the greater part of last year. 
um, crisis intervention fund and unclaimed fund trust fund. This is an introduction that was uh, made to the fi um, Finance Act. It says that a crisis intervention fund of 500 billion or other such sums as may be approved by the National Assembly is to be created to cater for national exigencies than crisis. So if you remember, COVID-19 fell upon us, even though we're all aware, monitoring what was happening all of last year, then we then saw individuals and um, philanthropic organizations supporting government and donating a um, couple of funds here and there. So what government is trying to do with the introduction of this um, um, legislation is to try and shop up um, an arrangement where they can have ready monies to provide relevant support um, in the event of national emergencies and um, crises in the country. Furthermore, um, you know, and another way they intend to fund some of this stuff is that any unclaimed um, stock funds or trust fund account is to be created. Go back, let me finish, let me finish the explanation on that side, please. Is to be created to support this. So what we're saying, or what government is saying here is there will be a trust fund that will be created, which will be supervised by the DMO, the Debt Management Office for the purpose of providing governments with the required support and funding in the event of crisis. So with the introduction of this um, stuff, government can be, can be assured that in the event of any future crisis, funds will be available to support them. Then the next thing is how do government intend to fund or create monies available in this trust fund? One of the areas that the Finance Act has introduced is that amounts in dormant accounts in Nigeria. So if you have a dormant account in Nigeria that has not been utilized for a couple of months and other unclaimed dividends of public um, limited liability companies which have not been utilized or claimed for the last six years or more will be immediately and automatically transferred to the unclaimed trust fund account. So I'm aware that certain individuals who are also on this call with me have actually gone to go and check all their dormant accounts to move out their monies and active, move, their, move out the monies from those um, um, dormant accounts and move them into, into um, their active accounts and also trying to liaise with their stockbrokers to claim all their um, unclaimed dividends for over the years. So, and, and there, there's a lot of money here because when you look at people who have, who have passed on and don't have um, you know, next of kin information for their family members, to be able to claim their dividends, you can imagine the quantum of money that will be going to this fund. And uh, it's our hope and desire that such funds, if eventually moved into the unclaimed funds, trust fund account, that um, government will actually use it for its um, correct intent, intended purpose. So other reforms, um, like Vivian mentioned, there are so many reforms that happen, but we've only just highlighted the important ones. So there are other new reforms and amendments to the Public Procurement Act, um, for those um, people involved in potential or potential government contractors, they should as well take up a copy of um, VM's tax law book and read up on the on the changes that were introduced um, to the to the Public Procurement Act. And I think with that, the end, last slide, Vivian. Yeah. So we've come to the end, and I think we need to. Are you able to um, play the tax law video while we um, get our participants to attendees to ask questions? So if you need to um, send information to the, um, to the firm, um, the firm can be reached on clients, that's C-L-I-E-N-T-S, at vi-m.com, or you visit our website, um, which is vi-m.com, and we are also available online real-time on all social media platforms, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube Live. Life. So Vivian, if you if you do have the um, tax log video, you can put it up. Otherwise, I can put it up for you. Then the floor the floor is open for questions and answers. Um, okay, Magnus, could you please take the questions in the Q and A box because I'm sharing my screen and I'm not able to open it. Okay, there, there, are, there are a couple of comments and questions. Um, one, of the que one of the comments here is, well done, this is fantastic. Thank you very much, Ogini Daniel. Um, his question is, the tax exemption for people earning below minimum wage binding on the states, considering the 
dwindling allocation from federal accounts and the need for states to increase internally generated revenue. So one thing I would like to mention here, I don't know why Vivian um, um, prepared to see if she has something to add to that question. There are two things I would like to add. Under the Capital Gains Tax Act, there is a revenue sharing formula for all those um, um, 50 naira for every deposit that is above 10,000 naira. The ratio is that the federal government is entitled to collect 15% while 85% is made available um, for, for the state. That's for, and stamp, in terms, that's for stamp duty. For stamp duty, sorry. That's for stamp duty. The, the tax exemption for people earning below minimum wage, um, I don't see that how, how that applies. So if you're exempted, if you, if you work in Lagos and you earn a minimum wage, you will not be paying tax to the Lagos State Inland Revenue Service. Whereas um, prior to this period, as long as you earn income, um, you know, you'll be paying minimum tax. So what we're saying is minimum tax will not apply for people who earn below the minimum wage. So um, that's a, that's a re revenue um, shortage for um, state government, but I'm certain that they would also be a bit more creative in trying to expand or increase the tax net of people um, that are liable to tax. Okay, so if, if I can add to that, the one of the amendments to the um, Personal Income Tax Act is to change reference, all the references made to service to um, board, and the definition of board is joint tax board. So if it's the joint tax board, that means it is binding on the state as well. So um, that, that's my own explanation. It, it has to be binding on all the states. So there's, a, there's, a, there's another question on the, on the um, chat room um, by Sunday, Sunday Chuku, I think. He's saying, please, does it mean that registered businesses making less than 25 million per annum in revenue will pay tax? Vivian, do you, want, do you want to add that or should I respond? Registered businesses making yes. 25 million or less. Million. Yes, business names, business names. Business names are not paying companies income tax. And the exemption is for, is under companies income tax for small companies. So if you're a registered business name, their exemption does not apply to you. Because registered business names, sole proprietors, they are taxable under the Personal Income Tax Act, and no such exemption has been given for small entrepreneurs or small enterprises in the Personal Income Tax Act. So there's a question here from Olufunke Hamzat, two questions actually. Um, Olufunke is asking, what is the calculation for tax for earnings like 35,000 naira. Olufuka, we can pick this um, tax, com um, tax computation outside, um, but I can share a couple of things. One, the effective tax rate, um, current effective tax rate, uh, based on the provisions of the law, should not exceed 18.96%. Meaning, if you check your tax amount and you divide it by your gross income, if you have any percentage that is higher than 18.96%, something is wrong, it should be lower. With 35,000 Naira, we need to compute the tax and find out whether the tax amount that needs to be paid on an income of 35,000 Naira is um, higher than um, the minimum tax. So if it is higher than the minimum tax, you pay that tax amount to you. If it is lower than the minimum tax, then you then need to calculate minimum tax on 35,000 Naira and then render. But I mean, you can chase with us, send an email to clients at vm.com um, and we can do a high level quick computation for you on what the exact tax would be for any that for, for someone who earns 35,000. Because there are other things we need to look at. Is, um, is this person um, um, involved in pension? What are the other associated earnings or stuff? And we can calculate his personal relief um, and consolidated relief allowance and arrive at the exact tax amount and then compare to the minimum wage and then advise. So we can pick that um, outside of this discussion. Drop an email and we'll get one of our consultants to provide assistance to you. Please expatiate on compensation for loss of 
Magnus. Magnus. Uh, right. If I may add something there, because I remember that under the compensation for loss of office, the law is specific about if this is less than 10 million, it's not taxable. If it is more than 10 million, it is the excess. So if it, it's in that light that the last, uh, um, the last question was asked, I don't, there's no uh, specific provision of the law that says excess of minimum wage. So that means if it's 35,000, like Magnus said, you still have to run it through, through the entire calculation. So like, as, as Vivian clarified, um, you know, to expatiate on compensation for loss of office, if, you are, if, if, you're, if, you're, if your employer is asking you to go and is compensating you for losing your employment, anything that your employer pays you that is between zero and 10 million naira, no tax should apply, no, no form of tax. You carry your 10 million naira and you walk away. If, however, your employer is paying you 16 million naira, for instance, what it means is that in the hands of the employee, 10 million naira is tax free. The employee will suffer tax on 6 million naira, that is the additional portion that is outside of 10 million, because the, the, the ceiling amount by the provisions of the capital gains tax is 10 million naira. So 6 million will now be liable to tax. Then the employer, whoever is making that payment, has the filing responsibility to render to the relevant state inland revenue. So if you live and work in Kano State, what it then means is your employer will need to render that um, capital gains tax and the returns to Kano State inland revenue on or before the tenth day of the following month that you receive the payment. If you receive the payment in the month of January 2021, then the employer has up until the 10th of uh, February 2021 to render the returns and make the payment to the um, tax relevant state tax authority. And for the purpose of my, for the example I'm using, Kano State Inland um, Service. I hope that is uh, clear. Then there's a further question here that says, can you please, can you do well to share the slides with the, particip uh, with the participants for the reference? So thank you very much, Ogumi. One thing we assure you is that all our participants would receive a link um, in an email in the course of today or tomorrow. The link will give you access to the recorded version of this webinar. It will point you to our um, you know, YouTube channel where our videos are loaded. Then you can listen and um, you know, view a recorded version of the webinar. If you need any further clarification or any assistance, um, like you know, taxes are unique to certain organizations. Your organization may have a peculiar um, you know, circumstance as compared to another organization. So we welcome you to engage our firm if you desire or engage your um, service provider, as it were, for a detailed analysis and understanding of your peculiar situation tax apply to you. What we've done today is to share our, our experience, our knowledge, our interpretation, and what we think that the revenue authorities are going to be doing over the next couple of months. Okay, there's um, another question from Olafunke Hamzat. Um, the question is disposal of assets. Please tell us the period of filing the returns. As stated earlier, um, the disposal of assets, assets that are disposed between the 1st of January and the 29th of June, you need to, you need to file the set of assessment returns on or before the 30th of June of that same year. If the disposal occurs between 1st of July and 30th of December, you still need to file the returns by the 31st of December of that same year. Okay? Any further questions? We're mindful that we've spent close to an hour, 23 minutes. Our target was to do this within one hour, but we will still allow, say, another seven minutes for more questions and clarification. Vivian, I don't know if there's anything you want to chip in. No, not yet. Okay. So maybe at this point, um, Vivian, could you unshare and give me access to share? Let me play the um, video for, for the tax law app so that our attendees can see what it is. Right. Okay.
want to thank all our attendees for, for your time so far, for all the questions raised, for your beautiful attention, and um, for joining us on this webinar. As we said, BM Professional Solution is a tax-focused um, audit advisory um, professional services firm, and our tax law app is available on, U on iOS and Android. So please do well to get a copy. Um, and download so that you can have the ac access to all the relevant changes and all the relevant legislations from the comfort of your phone and you don't need to bother about you know calling up um, various books records and changing it i mean you could be sitting in your office in your vehicle um, in front of a client or in front of um, a revenue authority and you can check the relevant legislation and then clarify um, to be sure what you're doing so um, we will be here to support you if you need any help um, feel free to send us an email at clients at vi-m.com or contact us on our website um, www.vi-m.com or follow us on any of our social media handles. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, okay, Samson Ajibade is raising his hand. Vivian, do you want to admit Samson Ajibade? Uh, I think he wants to ask a question. I think there's, there's also a question in the Q&A as well. Okay, let's admit, admit, admit something while... All right. Okay, um, from Olafunke Hamza says, thank you, VM, though she missed um, Vivian's presentation. So look out, for, look out for the email with the link to the recorded version of our webinar and you can then replay Vivian's um, presentation. Thank you, Olafunke, for joining us. So Samson, if you admitted Samson, can we hear you? Samson, you need to unmute your mic. Hello, good morning, sir. Good morning, Samson. Uh, sorry, I joined the uh, webinar late. Let's see. So, uh, I just saw the task law um, app. I also want to ask is it free to download it? Is it just the task law book I will type on the app to get it? And um, also, uh, how do I get the today, le today lesson? Okay, okay go ahead. tax law book is free to download from App Store. That is, if you have an Apple phone or Apple device or an iPad, then it's also free to download from the Google Play Store. That's for your Android devices. So it's on both stores and it's free to download. But for you to assess the laws inside of it, there's one tab that shows laws. So for you to assess those laws, you have to pay a token sum of 7,200. And the 7,200 is for life. So if you purchase it, we're going to be updating the tax law book in the coming weeks with the provisions of the Finance Act 2020. So if you purchase it, any, any time that there's an update or there are changes in the tax laws, you're going to get it free of charge. You're not going to have to pay again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Then, then the recording of today, it will be yes. on YouTube. It will be on our YouTube channel. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you will also see a lot of helpful videos for business process automation, tax, and the rest. So just search for bi-m or bi-m professional solutions on YouTube and you, you will just see all our videos, but we'll send a link. If you have, as you have attended this webinar today, we'll send you a link to share the video with you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, do we have any other questions? No, no other questions, comments. People who want There's to... no other questions. I think I think you have, you, we just need to close off. It's it's already one hour thirty minutes. All right. So thank you everyone. Thank you to all our participants from different industries, our former colleagues from the big four firms who are now some of them are now in no longer in big four. They are working in industry as industry leaders. Uh, former attendees from, from our Going Digital Nigeria series last year, um, our clients, our prospects, our friends, all those people who
who have signed up to share with us this morning an hour and 30 minutes of your time is not an easy thing to share on something and and if that thing is not very important you're not going to share it so so thank you so much for deeming us and our friend and our program important and for deeming uh, trusting us to share something that makes sense that is worth that time so um we do hope that with all the changes in the tax laws everybody can still keep abreast we also do hope that um, the economy improves and, and we, get, we have incomes to pay our taxes without being afraid or scared. Uh, we do hope that things will get easier, taxes will get easier to understand and practice, business will get easier, incomes will be easier to earn. We do hope that every one of us will have a good year, a good business year and a good year in, your, in our personal lives. So thank you so much um, as I sign off right now. Okay, Magnus, your final words. So thank you everyone. Thank you to all my colleagues um, that have helped, you know, even at the back end. Thank you to all our clients, friends, contacts, all the attendees, we thank you all. All I want to say is COVID-19 is real. Um, please let's adhere to all non-pharmaceutical um, requirements and protocols. Always wear your nose mask when you're going out of your um, comfort zone. And please wash and sanitize your hands. Stay safe. God bless. All the best in 2021. Bye, everyone. <laughs>